Marco, also Chief Economist and Global Strategist, ADM Investor Services. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Hello. Mark, we would like to kick off with the macro data. What do you think it is precise, precisely suggesting? And then, of course, what are your expectations from the Fed meeting? Uh, okay, so um, the only really interesting point was just how badly the ZEW survey fell in Germany today. I think the New York Fed fall, um, not really surprising. I don't think it's necessarily that big fall that we saw there, um, uh, uh, primarily driven uh, about, about fears of conflict, but by the petrol, uh, by gasoline prices and energy prices. That's really what's hurting uh, manufacturers in the United States. Uh, as for the PPI data, all I can really say is it's February data, so it doesn't encompass what we've seen um, in commodity and energy prices, which have been obviously enormously volatile. So what does the Fed do? Well, um, there are no good choices here. You know, uh, let, let's be honest about this. They, to a certain extent, they are, they are victims of their own policy. Um, they chose, as have all other major central banks, to um, go down a reactive rather than a proactive policy path. They misjudged the supply chain problems, which have obviously got that much worse as a result of the Ukraine war. Um, <clears throat> and now they're faced with basically trying to use an instrument, i.e. interest rates and uh, perhaps balance sheet reduction, um, to fight off what is supply-driven inflation rather than demand-driven. But interest rates are basically there to quell demand. Uh, so it's not a good instrument. Uh, my expectation in terms of tomorrow is, given the uncertainty of the situation, they probably may offer us some broad hints for what they might do in terms of balance sheet reduction or quantitative tightening, as it's called. Um, but they're not going to provide any detail until May when there's a, a hopefully um, will be a little bit more clarity on the situation that's going on in Ukraine. Um, uh, they will go with a 25 basis point hike. It's been effectively pre-announced. It's, it's what Mr. Powell told us in his testimony. Um, it's unusual for the, the Fed chairman to effectively pre-announce um, these sort of situations are my I have a recollection of um, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet doing much the same sort of thing about 10 years ago and it didn't end well um, <laughs> to be very honest but um, you know it's a vexed situation um, they're gonna need to you know the, the real problem is you know for 10 years or 10 12 years since the global financial crisis Central banks have been reliant on guidance, and now we're going into a complete 180 degree turn where they go from providing very heavy handed guidance to a lot of ambiguity, a little bit like the ECB last week. They, you know, no one, you know, it's not a situation where you can provide proper guidance. Um, you can say we will do whatever it takes to quell inflation, but they're not in control of it. The, uh, the only way of actually reining in any of the inflation at the moment is via legislative measures and fiscal measures. Uh, what the central bank does is at best complementary, um, but crushing demand, um, you know, i.e. I say an, an aggressive rate hike, uh, really isn't the solution to the problem. And we still really don't know where the biggest problem of all lies is how much productive capacity has been lost as a result of the pandemic. And what implications does this have in the long run? You know, can some of that productive cap capacity, which has been completely shuttered, particularly refining in the oil industry is the easy example we can at, how much you know, impact will that have in the longer term? And it's really very, it's a very difficult call, but all one can say is yes, oil prices may be falling back very sharply because we're hopeful about some peace emerging. But when we then, if, peace were to emerge, and that's not a forecast, I'm just saying putatively, um, will we still find ourselves with a lot of supply chain problems? And my thought on that is very simply, of course we will.
In fact, I was wondering, uh, because we saw, of course, uh, new lockdowns in China, we were talking about a Shenzhen area, we did see Hang Seng off about 6% throughout the uh, today's trading session, so a lot of selling over there, also the Shanghai component, the Shanghai composite, both off about 4.5%, Hong Kong, of course, uh, the Hang Seng market was a hard hit today, off about 5.72%, so I was wondering, uh, are you concerned about the situation in China in terms of lockdowns and specifically uh, bottlenecks, inflationary pressures, uh, and, and of course supply chain. Yeah, well, um, you know, the, the, clearly China's come to this moment, and it really is going to be interesting to see how they the react in the longer run. Uh, at the moment, they're still deploying the zero COVID um, policy. Um, in the longer run, well, we'll have to see how it goes. Um, in Europe, you can see we're not discussing COVID anymore, but actually in Germany, we've got a record number of infections infection rates in a lot of other countries, it's, it's going up much higher. In terms of the impact on supply chains, um, yes, you know, if China is in, a, in for a protracted period like uh, we saw last year back in August, um, in, initially actually what it does is alleviate some of the port problems in the US because nothing is going there, but the demand is still basically strong. We've still got a lot of catch up to do uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, so as soon as they come back on stream, uh, as and when restrictions are lifted, it just will create those problems again. So those problems are very much there. Um, I think the other thing which this all of this highlights as part of the move in the tech sector is actually um, due to um, all the fear on, on the sanction side of the equation. And it tells us something about the regime that we're in. You know, basically in the financial sector, where, you know, there's a lot of money provided for trade finance. Um, if you're in a situation where you're in the legal department, the risk department, um, <clears throat> and the compliance department in, in a large bank, your rule of thumb at the moment and your guidance to your staff is, unless you can give me 110% reassurance that we are not going to be find ourselves on the end of either reputational damage even if it's proven in the long run that they didn't break sanctions or if they do break sanctions the sort of litigation that they saw a lot of post um the post global financial crisis and so they will always err on the side of the answer is no until you can prove me give me a rock, rock a hard case that it should be yes that slows down trade finance around the world um and that actually is probably the most damaging thing that can happen on top of all the bottlenecks that we've got. Uh, because if we start slowing trade finance and it will impact emerging market countries that much quicker uh, because they are, you know, that they have much more fri financial, fragile uh, financial backdrop, you know, that could be actually potentially a longer lasting impact uh, from that. And, and Mark, final take, do you think that uh, what actually the United States decided to do, which is to, to ban um, crude oil and, and of course gas imports from Russia and many other, of course, uh, raw materials was the right decision to do? And how much do you think this is going to impact the inflationary pressures? Because the Fed might control, of course, from some point of view, inflation through interest rates, but not when it comes to energy prices. Not to do with energy prices, not to do with agricultural prices. They can certainly start pulling some of the housing problems, but that's a completely different story. They can't actually control it. So uh, we're, we're in that situation with, you know, on the energy side is, again, where you know, there's no good choices. Uh, you know, if we actually look at the situation, what we're doing is um, uh, starting to knock at the door of people we previously treated as pariahs like Venezuela, uh, like Iran. Uh, Iran doesn't really seem to want to play ball. Uh, Venezuela certainly is it's in its interest to try and loosen some of the sanctions that it's got on it. Um, but it's, you know, and actually Venezuelan oil is the best oil for going into US refiners because you don't have to treat it much before it goes in to be refined. So it would alleviate the problem quite quickly. Um, but we are still basically in a tight oil market and actually you know, making it that much tighter. Well, I, I can understand the motivation, of course, because otherwise you're basically putting money in um, Putin's war machine, so to speak, from a political perspective. Um, 
On the other hand, you are still also looking at your own domestic consumers and businesses, which are going to be suffering as a result, you know, from the higher energy costs. And, you know, as I said in, in the commentary on your Fed manufacturing survey, that hits businesses quite hard. Thank you very much. Mark also, Chief Economist and Global Strategy, CADM Investor Services. Have a great day, Mark, and talk to you soon. Yes, absolutely.